Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Blessings again to everyone in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, in the name of Jesus, the Christ. We're back with you in chapter four. Yesterday, we attempted to try to do three and four together in the same podcast, but I get a little bit long-winded and I go too long. And One, I, I don't help much either. <laughs> no, you're doing well. I remember a long time ago, there was a young man, he was a teenager back then, that came to me and said, you're the ever-ready bunny. You keep going and going and going. And I've never forgotten that. I need to really get to the point, stay with the point, and then move on. But some of these principles are so powerful, it's hard to move on because it affects everything within our lives. When we look at chapter 3, it's flowing into chapter 4. And remember, the chapter and the verse divisions come later. We're still dealing with the same thought processes. Mm -hmm. In fact, the first four chapters are dealing with these divisions. And they're infants, and they're not going to be able to grow up as long as these factions and these divisions are in the body of Christ. And so these divisions did not come from Apollos, did not come from Paul, did not come from Peter, but there are individuals within the congregation that are seizing the opportunity to try to get young believers to follow them and that they have the right to speak into their lives. And that's really going to come out in this next chapter. Verse 1, let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. I believe the greatest understanding of who we are as ministers of the gospel, as followers of Christ, is a servant of Christ, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are servants of Christ. Uh, it's not about us. It's about serving Him. And as we serve Him, others can imitate our life. The greatest lessons that we ever teach is not by going to a classroom where we open our mouths, but it's by our life that is following and is as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we are stewards of the mysteries of God. That as a minister of the gospel, Paul is saying, the mysteries of God, I'm bringing these truths to the Corinthians that they did not know, and I'm bringing the truths of God's word to them. So we have to be good stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. So if we're going to bring the truth of the gospel to the Gentile world, we must be a good steward and found trustworthy of the things of God. Because remember, these Corinthians, uh, Yoni, are coming from a pagan background, do not have any background in the in the Word of God, in the Hebrew Scriptures, which is now in the Greek language, that were, you know, when we look at them revealing the truth of God's Word from the Hebrew Scriptures, we're really looking at the Greek Scriptures. Ninety percent of everything that is being quoted in the New Covenant is coming from the Septuagint, mm. the Greek Old Testament. And as they're preaching the gospel in the world language, which is also the language of the Jewish people around the world. The Jewish Bible is in the Greek language. The largest community of Jews in the world is in Alexandria, Egypt, which is Greek-speaking. Their first language, their study of the Bible is in the Greek language. So they are bringing the truth of God's Word in the Greek Scriptures explaining the new covenant to a people that know the Greek language, but they don't have any background in the mm. Word of God. You see how I'm expanding too much here. Very neat. Mm. But they're bringing mysteries to them. And we have to be found trustworthy 
not to develop factions, not to destroy the temple of God, but to bring everybody under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be servants of Christ. Which, which goes against this, this idea of factions, which has been going on in this, in this church. Yes. The idea of bringing under, everybody under the lordship or the, the stewardship of Jesus. Yes, very much. And think about the background of Corinth, the philosophical background. People would actually buy tickets to go hear philosophers. And every philosopher wants to develop a following. Mm. And so those factions are developing in this Hellenistic culture within the body of Christ. And they're infants, and they're not going to be able to grow up until they get this settled. And unless Paul settles this argument in these first in the beginning of this letter, he's not going to be able to speak to the issues that are so degrading to the gospel in this congregation that he's about to speak to. Chapter 5, a man sleeping with his father's wife that is actually attending the congregation. Chapter 6, they are bringing lawsuits against each other. And it will go on and on. So who has the right to speak is going to be established in this chapter here. And let's follow this train of thought. We must be servants of Christ. We must be trustworthy. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Verse 3, But to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. But the one who examines me is the Lord. So if you isolate Scripture, you would say, well, Paul never examines his life. No. What he is saying, he examines his life by the Lord, by going to the Lord and praying and seeking God. God, search my heart. That's what David says in the Old Covenant. Search my heart, O God. So it is the Lord who examines me. It is the Lord that looks into my life. I'm not under your authority or any human court. I don't even examine myself. But I go to the Lord, and it is the Lord who examines me. And you also get a picture here that people are criticizing and coming against the authority of Paul. Now let's go on to verse 5. Therefore, Do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. Remember chapter 3, the work that we will do, that we are doing for God's glory, will be tested by fire. And if we don't have the right motives, that work will be destroyed. Even though we're saved, that work will be destroyed because everything that we're trying to do will be refined by fire. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other." So he's using Apollos and using his own name to make an illustration of how factions should not develop and how they should not have divisions within the body. You shouldn't say, I am of Apollos and I am of Paul. He's using this figuratively so that they don't go beyond what has been written to them. His goal is to bring them under the authority of Christ and the foundation of Christ. Paul and Apollos are not anything. Verse 7, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? He's taking them back to the beginning. Paul planted the gospel in Corinth. Apollos comes later and waters what Paul has planted, but he's reminding them they're not anything. It's God that brings the increase. 
But now there are people in the congregation that want to say, well, Paul did not do anything here. We received it ourselves. And they are propping themselves up and at the same time putting Paul and Apollos and others down. And they want to be the teachers. They want to have the authority over the people at Corinth. Now, this is really going to come out in Paul's second letter. In fact, some of them are slapping them in the face, physical abuse, to keep these divisions and these factions under their authority. Interesting. Verses 8 through 13, you're going to see sarcasm. And Paul writes sarcastically in many different places. And if you don't catch the sarcasm, then you're going to miss what Paul is saying. And sometimes people miss it here because these individuals that are regarding themselves as superior to Paul and to Apollos who brought the gospel and watered the gospel to them, they are saying that we're greater than them. And Paul's going to establish his right to speak here. You are already filled. You have become rich. You have become kings without us. Sarcasm. And indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we also might reign with you. You're the leaders. You're the kings. And if you're kings, well, maybe we can have a part of your kingdom. Uh, Hopefully that makes sense. It's sarcasm. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all. Now, when Paul writes to the Ephesians, what comes first? Apostles, then prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers. But now he's speaking with sarcasm. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. So, we're last of all. He's speaking with sarcasm. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent, wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. Boy, that really goes against the prosperity gospel. Mm. I mean, people are attacking them because of their present situation as ministers of the gospel. Well, if Paul is so great, why is he homeless? Just the opposite of the prosperity teachers today. Look at me. I have a jet. I have a house. Look at my $5 million home. Look how God is blessing me. All right. That mentality was with some of the factions within the Corinthian church. Well, if Paul is such a great place, why doesn't he have a home? Hmm. I mean, if Paul is such a great leader and a great apostle, then how can he help us? He can't even feed himself. Hmm. He has to work with his own hands. He doesn't even have a home. Look at how much suffering that he's going through. This is sarcasm that Paul is speaking with. Which I get, again, like what you said, it kind of mirrors kind of our modern society so much because we've got these pastors that like to have these congregations that flock to their personas and they, they follow them as individuals and they have these, you know, admirable lifestyles that they try to display and portray which is very different than what the apostles of old really look like. Yes, and I'm glad you said that. The image is they're speaking to a congregation. If you follow me and my teachings, you can be like me. Mm -hmm. And it's all about image sometimes. Handsome, strong, wealthy. Paul was short, if we understand historical data. Mm -hmm. Not much of a physical appearance. Yeshua, there wasn't anything about his physical appearance that attracted us to him. What I'm saying here, when others today, they look at a leader and they say, I want to be like him. Mm -hmm. And if I follow his teaching, then I can be successful and I can get up, I Mm -hmm. can speak, and I can show everybody how well Mm -hmm. I'm doing. 
And that's the kind of the immaturity too that that's getting talked about here in, yes. in Corinthians. Yes. And that's building factions, and then the ones that are building the factions that actually want to keep people under their authority and looking at Paul. Hey, you want to follow him? He's he's homeless. He has to go out and work with his own hands. He doesn't even have people that will give money to support his ministry. In fact, many of the times that Paul worked with his own hands was he didn't want to give the enemy an accusation that he's doing it for money. So there is a danger today of following an individual that looks the part, that speaks the part, that wants to bring us in self-fulfillment in our lives. We want to be like them. And then we look at another person that's out here working with his own hands that is bringing the gospel. Hey, he doesn't have much going for him. He doesn't even live in a nice home. He doesn't drive a nice car. In fact, his car breaks down all the time. This is what is happening in the church at Corinth. May it never happen to us. May we never look at a person's physical appearance and say that God's not with them. Amen. Let's continue. Verse 12. And we toil, working with our own hands, and we are reviled. We bless when we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slander, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. Think about that. I believe, if I'm reading this right contextually, these are the accusations that are coming from some of these factions, from some of the people that are trying to be leaders downgrading the very people that brought the gospel to them. And today, Yoni, there are people all around that want to come into churches and come in. They didn't even bring them to the Lord. They didn't even lay the foundation. They didn't even water the foundation. They weren't even there from the beginning. But they want to come in and say, everybody follow me and look at me and look what I'm doing. And they develop a following. And they want to show how everybody else is doing it wrong. They're doing it right. And you have to be careful with those individuals. We're all under the authority of Christ, and it's all about the foundation of Christ. It shouldn't be about us. It should all be about him. Paul has the right to speak because he brought the gospel to them. Verse 14, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Now, don't take this too far. See it within its context. You don't see all throughout the New Covenant Scriptures calling the person that led us to faith father. But there is that concept that Paul was a spiritual father to them. And as a father, and they were his spiritual children, he has a right to speak to their lives. He laid the foundation of Christ. He brought the gospel to them. He discipled them. Apollos came and and worked with him and watered that foundation, which was in Christ. And he has a right to speak as a spiritual father. That, That is true. He has a right to speak as a spiritual father. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. Now, do not isolate that from the rest of everything that he has said. Because he's already said, I'm not anything. The foundation is Christ. You didn't get baptized into Paul. You were baptized into Christ, his baptism. So what he is saying, be imitators of me, of what I have shown you in Christ. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my ways, which are in the Messiah. Imitate me, but my ways are in the Messiah. It's never separated from following Christ. Just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. So some within the church have become arrogant and they're really degrading Paul or they're really putting Paul down. But Paul was their spiritual father in the faith. He has a right to speak. But some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. 
For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. It's a work of God's Holy Spirit. We want to see if these individuals represent the power of God, the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and is God backing them up? What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? What Mm. he is saying to them, break these factions Get out of there under their authority. Whoever is developing these factions, they didn't plant the gospel. They didn't water the gospel. They want to hold you to them. They're putting us down. But I am a spiritual father. I will speak to this. Follow me as I lead you in the things of Christ. And when I come to you, are you going to be in submission to what I am saying? Are you going to be in rebellion? Do I have to come with rod? Or do I come in a spirit of gentleness with the love of God? And he's warning them. This is a strong warning to these factions that are taking place. Now going to chapter 1, Christ will not be divided. Chapter 1, we all come in unity under him. Chapter 2, the beginning of this church was a work of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. Chapter 3, it's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It is about God who brings the increase. We are not anything. Chapter 4, we were the ones that brought the gospel. Apollos did water. We do have a right to speak. Follow us as we teach you the things of Christ. And it's not about anything else. Now, when I come to you, are we going to find you listening? Are we going to find rebellion within the body of Christ there at Corinth? powerful message here as we're closing out this chapter four that we understand that these dynamics that were in the Corinthian congregation is with us today. We face these same dynamics today within the body of Christ. Is Christ the foundation? Do we come into unity under his authority? Do we recognize that the body of the Messiah is bigger than just me? For example, Yoni, when I look at the believers in Birmingham, I don't see 2,000 churches. I see one body of the Messiah. Now, there are some of them that may be heretical. There are some that have gone away from the faith. I understand that, but I'm talking about the body of Christ. We are one body. We are the church of Birmingham. And those are my brothers and sisters in the faith. So I'm not trying to gather people for the Assemblies of God or for the Methodists or for the Presbyterians or for the Episcopalians or for the Messianic congregations. It's not anything about all of that. That is not my focus. It is about bringing people under the authority of the Messiah to serve him. He is our foundation. He is our everything. And we're one body. And we have one shepherd And we are shepherds, are people used by God that are leading people under the authority of the Good Shepherd. And so that is our responsibility as ministers of the gospel. And so Christ is not divided in Birmingham. Christ is not divided around the world. And sometimes we try to divide the body of Christ into hundreds of different ways. And again, I'm not speaking against groups and denominations and organizations. I think these have powerful, positive things involved in them. But once they become negative, when we say we are the body of Christ and you're not. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's one denomination called the Church of Christ, which I believe is a cult. If you really examine their doctrine, you're not saved until you are baptized into the church of Christ. That's a different gospel. I am saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I identify with him. It's not about your organization. It's not about how coming into your church, we are the body of Christ. And so when we look at these kind of things, we deal with these dynamics all the time. We also deal with dynamics of Teachers coming in through radio, through television, coming into the pulpits that want to pull the foundation away from Christ and make it about them. Or make it about some specific knowledge. Oh, we focus on this. And and I guess as you're sharing this, I can even see this, you know, personally, not even in in the sense of large organizations, but personally, 
it's so easy for us to start identifying ourselves and say, oh, well, I am all about the Old Testament, or I'm all about whatever it might be. And for some reason, you, you naturally think, well, that makes me superior than these others that don't have my knowledge. And, and, and kind of what we're reading about, that is a, a, a clear sign of immaturity. Yes, it is. And it's dividing the house of God. And he says, you are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And if you destroy the temple of God, God will destroy you. So when an individual comes in and starts developing factions, come and listen to me. I will show you the right way. And these individuals that brought you to Christ, that have given you the word of God, that have revealed the mysteries of God to you, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. Come and listen to me. I'll take you into a deeper understanding of the things of God. Mm. And it all becomes about them. There is a strong warning that the judgment of God will come against them. Wow. Because we're one body, one foundation. We're under one authority. And everything that we do is to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. These dynamics are here today. They never went away. We have to battle them today. Keep the right perspective. Let your faith be guided by the Word of God. And the Spirit of God will take God's Word and make it so real that when a divisive person comes in that wants to make it about them, you will know this is not of God. i, I got to bring this up because... Because we were just talking about this before we recorded this podcast. There's a there's you know there's the Hebrew Roots movement, and there's a lot of great things that are in that movement. But there's also a lot of factions in that movement that tend to portray this image that we have this exclusive knowledge, that we are more wise than the others, and the rest don't understand. What we've read seems to also stand against that as well, that divisiveness. Yes, uh, I think that's a, a good example. I try to stay a, a way of singling out certain things, but I did with the Church of Christ and will mm-hmm. do here as well with the Hebrew Roots Movement. Teachers that come in, they didn't lead you to the Lord. They didn't lay the foundation of Christ. They didn't water it, but they come in, okay, these churches are pagan. They don't know what they're doing and we have a right to speak and come listen to us. We can lead you in the right way. Now, they start developing factions among themselves Mm -hmm. because they try to put you under the law. Not everyone in the Hebrew Roots movement puts themselves under the law, but a great majority Mm -hmm. of them. And then they start arguing over the law. But they're so much superior than we weak ministers coming from the church background. And they start dividing the body of Christ and putting the focus upon them. And then the next thing you know that the name Jesus, the name Yeshua, becomes something very insignificant down the road. Mm. It's all about what we eat, what we drink, what day we worship the Lord. Do we keep the feast or not keep the feast? How we are teaching the Word of God, all these kind of things. And it all becomes about them. And then they start arguing over these kind of things. And then they start splitting. And if you look at the Hebrew Roots movement, all their teachers just start splitting from each other. Well, I I know it better than this guy knows it. So the principles of destruction, they start destroying themselves. But as a minister of the gospel, whose foundation is Christ, I'm coming to build up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Not my gospel Not my teachings, but Jesus. Yes, and I want to build on that foundation. And I'm not dividing the body of Christ. I'm bringing edification to the body of Christ. And if there's something that has to be rebuked, yes, we do that. We rebuke something that doesn't represent the Word of God. But it's not about me. It's all about bringing people back that their eyes are on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Think about Hebrews 12. He instructs the Jewish believers that are abandoning the new covenant and putting their identity back on the old covenant for their identity to save their homes and to save their lives. And because it was protected, but anyone who named the name of Christ, you could go to prison at that time. He says, put your eyes on Yeshua, on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. It is all. Everything that we do is to teach people to follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
Imitate me as I teach you the things of Christ, the foundation of Christ. Come in agreement under his authority. And everything that's leading you away from him is not of God. That is something is a scriptural truth that you'll find anywhere within the new covenant, that anything that is leading you away from Christ and putting it on an individual that is saying you have to go back under the law or it's about this, it's about that. And you'll notice in their services, the only time that you hear the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, is at the end of a prayer. Be very careful of that. Because our job as ministers of the gospel is to bring you to Christ, to see you sustained in Christ, that you stand complete in Christ, and the hope that we have is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, take this truth, build it within our hearts, build it within the body of the Messiah. Lord, that you are our everything, that we stand complete in Christ. And Lord, I just pray that we will have the right motives, the right message, the right understanding. And it's not about us. It's all about you. Keep us servants of Christ, I pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com. And connect with us on Instagram at Integrity underscore Global and Facebook at Integrity Global Missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.